Hello and welcome to The Green Room at Furnitubes. I'm your host, Catherine Barrett, and we're here every month with a new episode. Join us for industry musings, interviews and discussions exploring all things landscape architecture, street furniture and urban design. Today I'm joined by Jonathan Bourne, Director of Bourne Amenity. Bourne Amenity manufacture and blends high quality bespoke topsoils and substrates and Jonathan is here today to discuss the importance of good soil and how it contributes to overall sustainability across the supply chain. Hi Jonathan. Hello, happy to be here. Good, thanks for coming. So Jonathan, what is Bourne Amenity and what do you do? So Born Amenity is a company that is a family-based company. We've been around for 20, 30 years, part of a larger group. And what we do primarily is manufacture soils, substrates, root zones, anything that you put in the ground and plant things into and hope that they grow. We've been doing that around the southeast for quite a while now, and we're involved in anything that goes with that. So seed, turf but primarily soils and substrates and anything that you have to grow plants and trees in. And how has that changed over the last few years? So unfashionably is it is to probably say, but COVID has been very good for the industry. It's kind of brought to light the requirement for green spaces and green infrastructure and the need for people to go outside and have that time away from the noise and hustle and bustle. So for us, it's been it's been good. It's been a really buoyant couple of years and it's carrying on now. We're seeing a lot of green projects be signed off. So it's been a very, very busy couple of years, which is great for the industry and everyone's thriving and it's sort of brought real attention to green yeah, spaces. Yeah. yeah, so it benefits the public really at the end of the day. Yeah, it's the right yeah. thing. I think we all knew that we, we, yeah. we sort of need to be outside a bit more and I think this has really brought it to the forefront when we were locked down inside our houses that there was a longing to kind of breathe some fresh air and see a tree and yep. play on the grass that a lot of projects have now been signed off and they want to try and bring as much greenery, especially to urban environments. Great. And so what's good soil and what does the British soil industry look like at the moment? Good soil is quite a subjective sort of question. Um, It depends on the project, the requirement of the project, what the project's trying to achieve. So rather than good, it's probably words like effective, Mm. durable, sustainable soils. But it very much depends on what the project is trying to achieve. Good soil in general is something that supports good nutrient growth has good water retention, but then some projects require water to be moved quite quickly. So as long as it's consistent and clean, then you could say that's good. But ideally what you want is a durable soil that'll perform from day one as it does 20, 30 years down the line. So there's lots of different criteria that make up a good soil. And what makes soil sustainable? What's the sustainable soil you mentioned just now? The sustainable side of it is, I guess, is You don't want to be putting a soil into position and having to keep working on it, keep amending it. You want a soil that's going to be in there and it's going to perform, do its thing, create a positive environment for whatever is being planted into it. So it's not necessarily looking on paper what is the right sort of soil. It's about looking at that soil 10, 20 years down the line. If it's going to be compacted, if people are going to be walking on it a lot, then it's going to have to be a soil that's free draining. Essentially, a soils will find a natural level to themselves. So if the soil that goes in in the first place is a good, friable, nutritious soil, it will tend to look after itself. Nature yep. finds its way and does its thing. So you want to be looking for a long-term, sustainable, healthy soil. So what are the different types of soil then and why is it important to use the right kind of soil? We've been making soil, as I say, for 20, 30 years. When I started back in 2010, we probably had two or three different types of soil. There wasn't that much certification or specification going on, but then the Olympics happened and we started to see people asking for really specific types of soil and criteria that they had to match, whether it was pH, organic matter, drainage. So there's now on our website, in our repertoire, probably between 30 and 40 different types of soils that, Mm -hmm. that do different things. And that all comes about by our clients saying, right, this is your British standard soil. We want it, we like that, but we want it to do a little bit more. Yep. We want it to drain a little bit faster. We want it to be 
you know, low nutrient soil is very popular post Olympics after their big wildflower um, displays. So yeah, we're blending every year. We're adding two or three more soils to our repertoire, which, which are just tweaks on the soils we have available. And it all, it's all client led. They ask for weird and wonderful things and some of them achievable, some of them not. Once we blend them and make them, then they're available and we can yep. say, listen, that worked for this client, this worked for that client, this is how it works. So we're sort of becoming, you know, a little bit of a... You're a mixologist yeah, for soil. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like It's like making a cake or a cocktail. You can yep. kind of add little bits and pieces and there's no... It's not textbook stuff really because you're dealing with natural materials. So yep. there can be like a variation, but the, um, the theory is kind of sound in terms of adding bits to make it do different things. So it's just a question of seeing what the client requirement is. A lot of it's trial and error, you know, working with labs to see how materials perform and then seeing how they perform in the field versus in the lab. So we now, as I said, we now have 30, 40 different types of soils and that's sort of growing, which yep. makes life interesting yeah also you can go you can go and see how they're performing five six yeah. ten years on as yeah. well we, yeah we, we, we're sort of thinking about that in terms of because we've got we've got a lot of data for materials that gets tested in the laboratories yep. and, and we've got a lot of data which says this is that whatever but once the soil leaves our site and gets moved around a site compacted spread you know seeded then it, it takes up a new different sort of life of itself so we, we did actually a couple of years ago i was talking to um Tim O'Hare Associates yep. about looking back at some retrospective projects and seeing what they look like now. Cause it's all very well laying it, taking some photos. Everyone looks happy and it's great. <laughs> Four or five years down the line, you want to hope that that is performing, performing as it needs to be. And there's no puddling or dead plants or, and everyone's happy with it then. But you know, you, you'll always get some that haven't been maintained in the way they need to be maintained, or there's something that's gone on there right. in the intermi intermittent years. So that that is a good important study to go back and look at how your projects are performing yes how has the sort of increased focus on sustainability affected what you do and your operations well sustainability is the buzzword i guess that everyone draws attention to and we are no different in the fact that we run a fleet of trucks you know yep. that, that run on diesel at the moment that we're trying to look at ways of converting them to electric vehicles um if, if that's the way it's going our packaging and sustainability to that but i think a lot of it is not moving materials i think we touched on earlier not moving yep. materials too far oh. from where they're being manufactured yep and so because we manufacture quite a range of different types of specification of soil we'll often get clients with projects you know hundreds of miles away that says we want this soil we've seen it on your website we'd like this soil we know about it and Ultimately, uh, as we are right now, we have to make it in one of our own facilities right. in the South. We've got three or four facilities based around the M25 and it has to travel you know, right. a, a long way to get to the place. Whereas in theory, we should be trying to find local. Yep. I mean, it's, it's none of it's actually hugely complex. It's yeah. normally just the mixing of two or three different natural materials that can create the, the planting medium. So it's fairly straightforward, but it's the consistency and the reliability that you're looking for. So the sustainability side of it is trying to find local producers yep. that can manufacture to the standards that you need and you can have full confidence in that. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. Over and it's your years. stamp of, of quality. Yeah, and I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be anything to do with us, but it just has to, we have to make sure that the client is getting what they ask for yep. and that they're getting the, the first ton is the same as the thousandth ton. Yep. And in order to do that, you have to go visit, talk to people yeah. and just impart the knowledge that we've built up over 10 years to, to them and say, listen, this is how you do it. Don't yeah. do this, don't do that. Make sure you've done that. Screen it to the 10 mil or 5 mil, whatever it needs to be, yeah. just to make sure that they're, they're getting the consistency. But we're, we're getting there. You know, we've got good relationships with independent quarries and independent producers. And, and I'd say the Southeast is quite a way ahead in terms of, We've all got the British standard, but in terms of specifications for suds and that sort of thing, the Southeast is sort of leading that predominantly because London is yep. leading the way in terms of roof gardens and sud schemes. So it's about just educating other suppliers and saying, listen, this isn't tricky stuff, but you have to do things in a slightly different way. So it's, it's, it's getting there and it's happening. And I think we want to live in a world where 
material is traveling no more than 20, 30 miles to a specific project, which might not benefit us as a business, right. but it will definitely improve the, the carbon footprint of where these materials are coming from. Because I think if you're, if you're focused on the green environment, you know, hauling material hundreds of miles kind of doesn't really fit into that yep. remit. I mean, I think we, we've, we've only experienced about two or three projects where when we submit our tender, we've had to write down how far these materials traveled. Right. I think we've I think we've done that once right. in, in the past three or four years. Do you think it'll happen? I, more I think and more? I think it will, yeah. yeah. I mean we're working with one of our clients where a lot of our materials are supplied in bulk bags and yep. they they've developed a reusable bulk bag. So yeah. you can imagine we, we do hundreds of bulk bags every day and, yep. and those bulk bags normally just get yep. thrown away. Yep. Yep. Um, recycling them is tricky because yep. they're all sort of complex fibers yep. and that sort of thing. So they've developed a scheme where they are emptying the bag and refilling yep. it, which, yes. which seems to be a good way of doing things. But again, how that filters down into smaller companies that have really tight budgets, yep. you know, because it's all about, you know, the bottom line is there. But, we're, you know, we're moving in the right direction. So take us through the process of how you manufacture soil. How much is as dug versus manufactured? So the ASDUG versus manufactured soil, I wouldn't call it an argument, but there's a bit of a debate about it, that the ASDUG soils are naturally a better source of nutrients and more sustainable way of of planting. But there's only so much ASDUG soil you can take or you can move around. And there's a company called British Sugar who produce a lot of ASDUG topsoil that we work with for some of our schemes. Um, But in terms of a consistent, I mean, if you're talking about hundreds of tons of soil a day right there's no way you can get that from one we'll keep site up with that, you know, right. you'd, you'd be digging up the whole of the countryside so 90 percent of our soils are manufactured using yep. pretty basic materials from sand quarries uh, mixed with green waste compost and it does the job you know i think there's some recent studies looking back at these soils that are in situ um, for the past 10 years and they're full of life they're full of microbes they're full of worms they're, they 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 become a, a they take natural, on a life of their yeah, own they, they, yeah. they do they, they don't necessarily look like soils at the beginning they just look sort of a bit sandy but over time they they become real hotbeds for nu- nutritional microbial activity so we believe in manufactured soils and it is kind of the only way to really do it on a mass scale without Digging up the destroying whole the countryside, countryside. Yeah, yeah yeah and 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 it's the consistency that that the customers want and you can really get that when you're mixing the, the the materials yourself you get that consistency you get that reliability and you're not destroying you know green belt land or agricultural land so we're advocates for the manufactured soils and it also allows you to sort of change the way they they perform as well you know if you're if you're we've got various blending sites where we can take sands and grits and shingles and we can really sort of mix them up and create different things whereas a natural soil is the natural soil for a reason because it's good at what it does right. so changing and amending that you're sort of taking away its essence really so yeah. as dog soils are what we do and i think that's the way of making sure that there's enough to go around what are born immunity doing to help combat soil degradation we encourage clients as much as possible to use the soil that's on site Mm. i mean it sort of slightly goes against the business in terms of trying to sell more materials but i think tim o'hare is a very big advocate for improving the soils that are on site and looking at ways of not stripping everything out and starting afresh so you can enhance the soil that's already there even brownfield sites you know there are ways of sort of washing soils and capping soils off and not just throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just starting afresh. So soil degradation, I kind of, is more of an agricultural term, I guess, right. in terms of right. ruining agricultural and pasture land. Yep. But in terms of what we're doing, and I think the industry is moving away from stripping out, you know, thousands of tons of soil and just bringing new material in and looking at ways of bringing machinery to sites and enhancing the soil that's on there. Because, I mean, where we are in the southeast, it's all heavy clay. Yep. London saw heavy clay and that's not very desirable for planting schemes. So they tend to just rip that out and start again because the clay soil is not very workable, you know, it goes quite smeary. So a lot of these companies now are bringing in machines and adding sand to it just to create a more free right. draining. Right. And, and, and that, that is the way that it should be done. Yeah. Before they start talking about ripping out and starting again, there should be. What can you work with? Um, right yeah, there, there should be engaging yep. companies like Tim O'Hare from a really early phase yep. to get their expertise on what's in situ and how you can avoid 
just bringing in a, bre- a, a fresh material and, and it saves it saves on costs it saves on transport movement yeah. so it's a generally a, a good sustainable message and fits with your you know try and source as locally as possible exactly right. exactly exactly yeah. you know because a lot of the time you do you do see sites which have ripped out all the soil just based on a minor failure on a minor a bit of um, contamination or it's not quite what the architect wants or what yep. the specifier wants you know and I think with a little bit of help they can get over that mm-hmm. and they can just use what's available and just avoid carting things in and out and in and out and and you know because and also it's it's expensive to to, to get rid of soil now you know, right it's classed as a waste yeah. as soon as it's taken off the land yep. so as soon as somebody says it's a waste it's got to be you know it's got to be dumpster not only does yeah. it have to be disposed of it has to be a you know a line of um traceability right but it's expensive and people don't really want to touch it because it's deemed as a waste you know which is crazy because it's, it's greenfield good soil it's got value, yeah, which yeah. could really be used somewhere yep. else but yep. as soon as it's classed as a waste you know people don't want to touch it and it just tends to go to places where it's just left you to know. fill a quarry, old quarry exactly. basically yep. yeah so looking to the future, what are some of the ways that the soil industry is moving or can move towards to support a more sustainable future and the decarbonisation of, of part of the construction industry? I think, I think conversations have been had with, um, with, with soil scientists and, um, and, and, and leading experts in the field. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a guy, that Dan Evans for Cranfield University, who is heavily involved in the soil degradation and improving the soil quality so involving people like that right at the beginning of the conversation and trying to get people to understand how soils perform where they come from the sud side of it is something that's really relevant when you look at the recent weather we've had and and the flooding that's still happening in these places where it's happened you know it doesn't seem to be any sort of real it happens and then you know, people are damaged and they go on the news and then they're left, you know, and they're left. And it's still a problem that the water, although we're building all these houses, the water's got to go somewhere. Right. Um, and a lot of the time it's it's just run straight off the housing scheme into the fields, takes away the topsoil and just degrades the natural environment. Whereas if you if you implement suds um, schemes, then you're managing that rainwater runoff. And a lot of the yep. time you're recycling the water as well. So there is a big movement with architectural practices and and the suds element so there is things that are happening it's just important to have the conversations not not necessarily with ourselves as a manufacturer but with experts who know about soils who know about the local geology who can come in and say you know this is achievable this isn't achievable this will have this effect on the natural environment and have you thought about using as we talked about before more local materials to reduce carbon footprint and you know, create an environment which is kind of more part of what was there before so that the, the scheme sort of fits into its natural environment. Right, Jonathan, why do you do what you do and what do you love most about it? I do what I do. I mean, it's a family business, so you could say that I have to do what I do. But no, I've come into it about 10 years ago and it's a great industry to be in. You know, we've seen some real progression over the past 10 years and being involved in green spaces and green infrastructure. And most importantly, seeing people out enjoying the spaces that we've played a minor part in creating is a real satisfaction. You know, there's nothing better than being out, in, especially in the middle of London and being in a green yep. space and seeing people just sit down and just taking some time out from the hecticness of, of the urban space. That's really re- rewarding. Cool. I agree with that completely. What is one thing that landscape architects and the landscape architecture profession could do right now to help combat the climate disaster? From a perspective of us as a, as a sort of lowly soil supplier, we would like to influence design as much as we can. But I think when it comes to the architects, it's a question of trying to look at what's available locally mm. when they're designing schemes. A lot of the time we're supplying materials that are traveling quite a long way just because we have to satisfy certain specifications. So if we can try and talk to architects, which we do via our CPD sessions about trying to look at what's available locally in terms of soils, substrates, you know, and try and blend in with their local environment as much as possible. So we're not 
looking at materials that are being transported too far and adding to our carbon footprint like that. Ideally, don't want to transport materials more than 20, 30 miles. So if we can try and press on them that some things are available, some things aren't, and try and affect design like that, but notoriously architects tend to go their own way. You know, we might drop a suggestion in, but I'm sure that they will um, ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> And if you could put one bench in one spot in the world, where would it be and why? I think there is probably a bench there or two already. I think there's probably a cafe there as well, actually, which is... A, Even the, better. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm a big mountain man, ski man. So the, the top of the Pont de Mosette in the Alps would be my yep. place. You can yep. see France and yep. Switzerland from that one position. Take a jacket, probably, mm -hmm. some thermals. But yeah, that would be my place. On top of the world. On, on top of the world, yeah, looking down, just feeling very small and insignificant and seeing these sort of peaks rage around you, then that would be my happy, calm, yeah. cold place. Lovely. Yeah. The blue sky. Blue sky, ideally. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, a hint of some fresh snow for the next day. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks very much for joining us today, Jonathan. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>